thank you all for uh, coming uh, to this uh, Applied PD seminar at the University of Washington. Um, I am delighted to introduce today's speaker, Tom Bridges, who is a professor of mathematics at the University of uh, Surrey. Um, Tom got his PhD from Penn State University in 1984. Uh, and then after uh, a, short stays, uh, a short stay at Warwick, uh, I believe he's been at the University of uh, Surrey ever since. He's been very active in the uh, water wave community, especially uh, using Hamiltonian methods. Um, and he, um, he's also a frequent organizer of, of conferences and, and workshops uh, that we've, uh, you know, in the field of water waves that we've uh, been very happy to enjoy. Uh, and today he's going to tell us about, um, he's going to give us a reappraisal of Widom's 1967 theory for wave mean flow interaction in shallow water. Uh, and of course, uh, for those of you uh, familiar with the field, uh, this is not the first time Tom has something very significant to say about the Benjamin Fear instability. Thank you, Tom. Well, thank you very much, Bernard. And thank you very much for the invitation to, to speak here. And thanks to Jorge for helping me with the organization and setup. Uh, and I uh, want to say it's great to be back in Seattle. Uh, the last time I was in Seattle was 10 years ago at the SIAM Nonlinear Waves and Coherent Structures Conference in June 2012. Uh, okay, but on to the, uh, the talk at hand here. And um, so when we get to the 21st century part, this is joint work with uh, Dan Ratliff and Olga Trichenko. But first, I want to uh, look, go back 55 years and look at Widom's 1967 paper. Now, you might say this is a little bit odd considering the fact that um, from a practical point of view, this paper is obsolete. Uh, it's, uh, he derives a weakly nonlinear uh, shallow water equations for um, a wave coupled to a mean. And it's been largely superseded by equations like the Benny Roskis, Davy Stewartson, Booz and S models. Uh, however, there's still some interesting things we can learn from this work, and which I think will also feed in to other aspects of uh, shallow water water waves. And uh, okay, so uh, first, apologies to those people who are uh, experts in water waves and or Widom modulation theory. I want to give a, a basic introduction to what Widom was trying to do in this paper. Okay, Widom starts with Luke's Lagrangian for water waves. Okay, and then he introduces an ansatz for the flow with phases for the wave and mean. So even if you don't know why he's doing this, you can see um, what it is and you can proceed to analyze it. So if we take the velocity potential uh, to be this phase plus the uh, velocity potential for the wave and uh, where uh, k is a wave number, omega is a frequency, a beta is like a mean flow, and gamma is uh, what Widom calls a pseudo frequency, and b is uh, a mean depth. So if you just take this ansatz and you plug it into this L, this is what you get down here, equation 25, which is from his paper. Now, this is a, a straightforward calculation. Uh, nowadays, it could be done in about a nanosecond with uh, Mathematica or Maple or something like that. Uh, and um, in fact, in Widom's paper, he gives a derivation of this L in, in detail, and we've checked it, and uh, there's not even a typo in it, so that's all correct. Uh, so think about th this is just some algebraic and transcendental function of four uh, parameters. Um, I mean, uh, six parameters. You have uh, the two amplitudes, B and A, and the um, frequencies and pseudo frequencies and wave number and pseudo wave number. Okay, so remember what we're doing here is we have a basic state, which is the Stokes wave. Uh, and we wanna look over at a perturbation of that. And perturbation theory from the Widom point of view says you derive equations for the frequency and wave number and amplitude of the wave. Uh, and if we have a mean, then you derive equations for the mean velocity, the mean depth and the pseudo frequency. Okay, in these equations, uh, omega zero, C zero, et cetera, are just flow parameters. They're all familiar, uh, like group velocity and stuff like that for water waves. Okay, so there's a very nice tidy closed system, which is in fact just a hyperbolic conservation law. 
in gen in, oh i should say a first order one because first order pd because in fact it's not always hyperbolic and the characteristics or eigenvalues of the jacobi matrix and the only analysis that Widom does of these equations is to uh, study the characteristics and show there's a double characteristic at zero amplitude and splitting leads to a transition from hyperbolic to elliptic at the famous KH naught is equal to 1.363. Okay, again, apologies to, to the experts in Widom modulation theory. I want to make a few points about Widom modulation theory because we're going to find some problems with Widom's derivation we'll and, and fix them. Okay, so uh, let's look at Widom modulation theory in its most basic form. Starts with a PDE generated by a Lagrangian. For example, Widom's famous favorite example is the scalar uh, semilinear wave equation generated by a Lagrangian variational principle. Introduce a basic state, periodic traveling wave. That's the, the most basic uh, state that Widom modulates where A here is an amplitude, and this is a phase. If you just plug that into here, you get an average, you get a, some scale of valued function of the frequency of the wave number and the amplitude. Now, Widom's strategy, he says, okay, let omega be uh, a, a slowly varying function of X and T, which are, which are uh, slow to time and space variables. So omega is minus theta T and K is, my, is theta X substitute those in, and now you have this new variational principle uh, for theta and A. Since A has no derivatives, you just get LA is equal to zero, and variation with respect to theta gets, gives this equation. This is called conservation of wave action. Then you have the cross derivative equation, which is conservation of waves. So that is Widom modulation theory in a nutshell. Okay, there are three modulation parameters omega k and a, two modulation PDEs, and so you get to choose which two of these you want PDEs for. Now, if we get rid of the amplitude, then you end up with these two equations here, if I uh, multiply, uh, differentiate things out. Okay, uh, now I should point out, we'll come back to this, but Widom eliminates frequency and uses amplitude and wave number. I'll say more about that later. So the latter two equations are equivalent to these, and so the characteristics are just the eigenvalues of L. Now this, uh, or minus, depending on your convention, uh, this first order PD has an alternative formulation. Okay, if I go back to this equation, and I multiply the first line by A omega, assuming it's non-zero, and then I use conservation of waves to move this term over to here, then those uh, equations with a modulation theory in a single phase case actually is equivalent to a Hermitian problem, okay? Uh, because these two are symmetric. That's still a fully nonlinear equation, I should point out. Uh, but the Hermitian matrix pencil will come about when we start looking for characteristics. Now, uh, let, okay, so now let's go back. We know a little bit about Widow modulation theory. Now let's go back to um, W67. And I, I mentioned earlier, he starts with Luke's Lagrangian. And I want to flag up here that um, Luke's Lagrangian variational principle is now legendary in the theory of water waves. But uh, this paper of Widom was the first paper ever to use it. And not only that, they both appeared in the same issue of JFM. And you'll notice the page numbers here. Uh, Luke's article, which was only three pages, um, and Widom's was the very next article in that same issue. And if you look at the submission date, both papers were submitted on the exact same date in February uh, 1966. OK, and so nobody knew about this paper, I'm assuming, except for Widom. And he took advantage of it right away. And that's what's in, in this paper. Might have been that he got Luke to do it for the express purpose of doing this work. Okay, so now the coupled Widom modulation equations are obtained in the same way as the single phase case. 
Okay, I mean, they're the same equations. LB is equal to zero and uh, conservation of wave action for the pseudo uh, frequency of wave number and conservation of, of waves for, the, for this bit. It, okay, so just have two pairs of equations. Now, before I look at how these generate W67, I wanna look at them separately because one of the things I want to point out, one of the messages here is that mean flow has been under-respected. I wanna argue that mean flow has the same status as the wave. Uh, it, it's so often the case in, in waterways, people talk about, okay, I'm gonna have mean flow. And this is kind of this add-on to the study of the wave. I, a good example is that is Hashimoto and Ono, which derive a kind of uh, Benny Roskis equation with mean flow equations, but then say, ah, oh, you know, mean flow is, let's get rid of that. And then they convert it into one equation, which is an NLS equation, which of course is famous in, in the theory of water waves, an NLS equation of finite depth where the mean flow is thrown in the bin. Okay, now, um, so what I'm gonna do here first is I'm gonna say, suppose we only have a mean flow. Okay, so at this stage, what we're really looking at is uniform flow in classical hydraulics. Okay, we're just looking at a constant depth and a constant velocity. Okay, one dimensional open channel flow. Okay, so uh, that the, the velocity potential just be to x minus gamma t and the depth is just that. So these are really constants, but we can substitute those into Luke's Lagrangian and there's no averaging required now. And uh, we can modulate that we can modulate that trivial solution. Now modulate it the same way. You have Luke's Lagrangian here, do the same thing. Let gamma equal to a, a slowly variant phase, a derivative of a slowly invariant phase and a beta a slowly x derivative of the slowly variant phase. The modulation equations are these. Well, this is calculus. This is just a polynomial. What do they look like? Okay, well, LB is this. L gamma is that, which is the depth minus the depth, and L beta is that. It looks like a mass flux. So the two modulation equations are uh, these. Okay, so we have this extra equation L b should be zero. But the two modulation equations are these. They're not closed. Okay, and so one way to close them, and what seems like the most natural way to close them, is to insert b into the second equation using L b is equal to zero. Okay, you do that, you get this. Not a very pretty equation, not very informative, but it's closed. And this is, from the Widom perspective, the correct modulation equation for modulation of uniform flow. Okay, well, let's try a different strategy. We, we don't have to uh, eliminate B. Let's instead eliminate gamma. So we have the same two modulation equations, but now, insert gamma by solving LB is equal to zero. And what do you get? You get the shallow water equations. The absolutely, totally conventional shallow water equations. And G is, of course, the proper gravity. Okay, so what have we found? We have found that if you modulate uniform flow, trivial uniform flow, which is just uniform depth and constant mean velo constant velocity, there is no mean here or anything like that. I'm over, overusing the term. Uh, you apply widow modulation theory in its absolutely conventional way, you get to shallow water equations. Now, on one level, that's not terribly surprising. Um, if you look at even at W67, you'll see that you, the linearized shallow water equations appear. And if you look in Benny Roskis, the linearized shallow water equations appear. Okay, but um, still, these are the nonlinear shallow water equations. Now, let's separate out the wave and let's see if the wave has greater status. Okay, so now we just have the wave is a function of theta and is an amplitude, I should include that. In. Um, if you substitute into Luke's Lagrangian with averaging now required, of course, um, I've written it now in the most general form for a weekly nonlinear Widow modulation theory. And that is you have a dispersion relation times an amplitude squared plus the correction times a to the fourth. I've not called this omega two because it's not omega two. You get omega two 
when you substitute omega zero plus omega two a squared into the dispersion uh, into L a is equal to zero. Okay, but it's related, gamma is related to omega two in our conventional way of thinking about the correction to the frequency in water waves. Okay, now take our usual um, Widom phase and in the modulation equations or what we expect. Okay, no big surprises yet. Okay, so we have these three equations. We have two modulation equations. And so we, to close them, we need to eliminate one of the variables. Okay, so conventional way, you eliminate the amplitude. So you have two PDEs, one with frequency, uh, one for the frequency and the wave number. Okay, closed system, but not very informative. Okay, let's go back. Okay, we, we already got a clue from when we did the, the mean uh, of the um, uniform flow modulation. So uh, we have these two modulation equations. Now instead, let's eliminate the frequency using LA is equal to zero. Of course, we have to um, expand out omega here and so forth. I've skipped a few of the steps, but if we define new variables, H is mod of d omega, assuming d omega is not equal to zero. U is group velocity, weakly nonlinear group velocity, linear group velocity actually. Uh, and G prime is this object here, which should look familiar. Then the modulation equations for H and U are the shallow water equations. Okay, the only difference is G prime is not a constant. It's a function of the wave number and, but look at it, it's omega zero double prime times omega two. That is the, I'll call it the Widom index because it's that thing, the sign of that determines whether the characteristics in our basic Widom modulation theory are hyperbolic or elliptic. Okay, but now we see that it's easy because when G prime is negative, which is when omega two, omega zero double prime is positive, these are ill-posed. So uh, the ill-posedness of Widow modulation theory is encoded just in one single parameter in the equations. Okay, but wait a minute. These are the shallow water equations for the wave modulation. Now the, the, the modulation equations for the mean flow were exactly the same, the only difference was G. So the mean flow and the wave are really on the same footing. Okay, just a few comments about this. Um, uh, this is not specific to water waves or um, uh, or the W67. This is true for any weakly nonlinear um, Widow modulation theory. So the Widow, so transformation of the Widow modulation equations to the shallow water equations applies in general for weakly nonlinear waves. So you get a, a small irony here is that the modulation of weakly nonlinear Stokes waves on deep water is governed by the shallow water equations, but with G prime less than zero. On the other hand, if you add surface tension, there are values of parameters where uh, their the Stokes wave is modulation -y sta stable. So you get this curiosity that um, modulation of those waves, Stokes waves with surface tension in deep water are governed by the shallow water equations. <laughs> I don't know if that's useful in any way, but it is a, a curiosity. Okay, so now we're ready to go to W67. How do you do it? Well, it's the same, it's the same as single phases. You just have to, uh, you just use L for both. Okay, so we have L as a function of everything. And, but it's just calculus to get all the terms. And I'm just gonna do the mean flow first and we differentiate appropriately and substitute those in and eliminate gamma. We get the shallow water equations that we saw before, but we now have coupling. Okay, on the right-hand side, we get the derivatives of the wave part. Okay, what we expect. Now let's do the same thing with the wave modulation. Okay, and uh, now skipping a few steps, we know the, to eliminate omega. So the left-hand side would be the shallow water equations and the right-hand side is now modulation of the mean flow or the uniform flow. 
Okay. Now G prime shows up here, but G prime no longer has the significance it has for the single phase case. Okay. G prime will not determine stability or characteristic type. Okay. Because effectively everything is coupled now. Okay, so to summarize now, uh, the W67 equations for modulation of Stokes waves in finite depth are coupled shallow water equations. Okay, so the mean flow has the same form as the wave, and they're corrected. In fact, the, the, the mean flow has a little bit more, uh, a little stronger coupling there. It's kind of interesting that the, the wave component affects the conservation of mass of the uniform flow. Okay, but that's not what you see in W67. W67, he takes makes a few approximations, which I'm not really happy with, but I'll tolerate for now. Okay, he takes B to be order A squared, gamma order A squared, and U to be order A squared. So the mean flow he's taken to be order A squared. His argument, he doesn't say it explicitly, is he's, his mean flow is just a slave to the wave motion. Uh, okay, and so this is what Widham has. And in fact, this is exactly what you see in W67. If you um, unpack what I, the changes in notation I've introduced here, and I've been a little bit sloppy, I changed beta to U. Uh, well, no, I think I did mention that earlier. Okay. Now, I don't like this B is order A squared. And let's look at this. Okay. Now, in W67, implicitly, and in his book, explicitly, uh, Widom says that B is proportional to A squared. Okay, now, now th th this, is, this is interesting because it contradicts two equations in his own paper in W67. Now, I'm willing to accept this is probably correct to leading order, but let's see what the implications are. Okay, he has two equations, equation 38, and equation 36, and W67, these are them. So these are two equations. In reality, if you want to eliminate the amplitude, remember that was one way to close the equations. If you want to eliminate the amplitude, then you have two equations for the two amplitudes. You write them like this. Now, you can check. This determinant is non-zero for all interesting parameter values. So these are independent. So what is he doing? Now, well, let's uh, take this expression and put it in here. Because these are the right equations. That's his, his, that's his later idea. Let's put those in here. What happens? This becomes an equation for a squared only. This becomes an equation for a squared only. Well, you eliminate a squared. It's just a constraint on the modulation parameters. It becomes a function of gamma, u, omega, and k equal to zero. He introduces a constraint. Now, there's so many parameters in this problem. You wouldn't even notice this normally. Okay, but let's think about what it means. What, he's, what this does is it puts a constraint on these equations. It says these equations are not on all of R4, or actually in reality, they're not on R4, they're on R4 in a neighborhood of zero, but they're not even that. They're subject to a hypersurface. Okay, because if we take this constraint here, that's one function of four variables equal to zero. So that defines a hypersurface, it's actually curved slightly curved parabolically. Uh, so this, these equations are subject to that constraint. Now, interestingly enough, uh, in the limit as the amplitude goes to zero, the constraint vanishes. So uh, it looks like um, if you're close enough to the weekly, to the, to the zero amplitude, that, that will work. Okay, but I'm not happy with it. I haven't even checked this to see if this, uh, the, the, uh, the constraint is invariant under the flow of these equations. I haven't even checked it because you don't need this. There's really no reason. Okay, I must say that, you know, <clears throat> out of respect for Widom, I kind of believe this was maybe correct for a while. Now, let me show you another uh, context completely where we shake off the water wave and see that 
how, that this is maybe not a sensible approach. Okay, so um, I, I should say we don't need to do this. B is equal to something a squared. So this is the right way to go. And I'm going to argue from this other example. Now, let's take one of our favorite examples of for modulation of two phase wave trains. That's coupled NLS. Taking coupled NLS in its simplest form. I just want to make a point. Now, take your basic two phase wave trains of this equation. Okay, they have amplitude equations here, and I assume that that determinant is non zero. So you have a uniquely defined amplitudes. So it's, a, it's almost the same as these two equations. Now, so would we take A2 to be a constant times A1? In this equation, would we take A2 as of order A1? Well, we might argue they're the same order, but that's different. Okay, now if we did, you can see that we put a constraint. Uh, we get a linear constraint between omega one, K1 squared, K2 squared, and omega two, a linear function, and that would be a constraint on the modulation equations, with the modulation equations for these two phase wave trains, which we haven't derived yet. Let's derive them. They're the shallow water equations. But this is to some degree known um, because with a modulation theory is more or less equivalent to doing a Madelung transformation in this case. Um, and you know that the Madelung transformation produces a kind of um, shallow water equations with dispersive terms and the limit as dispersive terms go away is the equivalent to the with a modulation equations modulo some <clears throat> additional analysis. Okay, so let me just call these the Witter modulation equations for the two phase wave trains of NLS, coupled NLS. Well, they, they turn out to be um, uh, these, and uh, G1 and G2 are consistent with what I showed earlier because if you set beta 1, 2 is equal to zero, then the product of alpha 1 and beta 1, 1 determines stability of the uncoupled single phase wave train. So that's what's showing up here in G1 and G2. But then we have coupling. The coupling is a little bit simpler than water wave uh, uh, equations, but my principal argument here is that the coupled shallow water equations here for modulation of CNLS are almost identical to W67. Okay, and, and here we would never think of one of these as a slave to the other. Okay, so now <clears throat> back to W67, uh, let's look at what he, the main thing he applies this, these equations to, and that is um, he looks at characteristics and finds that um, uh, you can have double characteristics. Okay, so uh, if you double characteristics are just, uh, this function and this derivative equal to zero. Um, he does the explicit calculation uh, and then writes out this, the, this formula to leading order and you get something like this uh, with f at zero is equal to zero. So what Widom finds is if you compute the characteristics and limit of zero amplitude, you get uh, a double characteristic. Okay, so you get the two shallow water characteristics and you get uh, this other characteristic which unfolds to a square root and that square root can change sign. Now, keep in mind this is in shallow water, square root of GH zero is also the group velocity. So this is also the group velocity in shallow water. Okay, so you get a picture like this. You have the two wave modes which collide and become unstable if you plot them in, uh, if you plot the, uh, if you multiply by I, um, the characteristics, because those are a bit like stability exponents. And then this is the, the wave mode. Um, now, here's the interesting thing. You have two, if you look at it this way, the characteristics multiply by I, you have collision on the imaginary axis and going off. So it looks like a crying signature type problem. So is crying signature relevant? Well. As far as we're aware, uh, we can't find any symplectic structure in Wooden modulation theory. And you could twist yourself into a pretzel and maybe come up with something, but it's unnatural. Okay. Now, on the other hand, remember earlier we showed that Wooden modulation theory can be symmetrized. 
And you can do that here. And you can show that his W67 equations are actually of this form, where these are all symmetric matrices. Okay, so the equation for characteristics now, well, if you assume these are constant matrices and take uh, either the I alpha X minus CT, then the characteristics satisfy are the eigenvalues of a Hermitian matrix pencil relative to an indefinite metric. Okay, so here's the equation for the characteristics, two symmetric matrices, and G is indefinite. In fact, you can prove at, for, uh, abstract equations of this type that the metric is indefinite. So why is the Hermitian form with indefinite metric interesting? And how general is this form of the characteristic eigenvalue problem for multiphase window modulation theory? So let's now look at the um, usual form of multiphase window modulation theory. And that is where you have a basic state which consists of n uppercase n phases all periodic, all two pi periodic, then window modulation equations can always be cast into the abstract form like this. So you have vector value conservation of wave action, vector value conservation of waves, and the fact that A and B come from a Lagrangian gives you a symmetry on these matrices. Now, unfortunately, with all these phases, you can have small divisors, uh, but if you have symmetry, then they can be robust in symmetric non-integrable systems. Now, let's just take the, that abstract form, differentiate that out. Now multiply the second equation by d omega a, assume it's an invertible, and use the symmetry of the derivatives of a, b on that, and we get this form. So this is abstract window modulation theory linearization, everything is symmetric. Now introduce the normal modon dots and rearrange and you have symmetric, symmetric, eigenvalue. Okay, so the, the main point here is the characteristics of linearized multiphase Wood modulation theory, including W67, are eigenvalues of a Hermitian matrix pencil. With G indefinite, characteristics can be complex. So symmetric matrices have all real eigenvalues, but symmetric matrices relative to an indefinite metric can be complex. Now, simple eigenvalues of Hermitian matrix pencils have a sign characteristic, which is analogous to a Krein signature. It's a bit more general and way predates it. Uh, most references give credit to Weierstrass and Weierstrass in 1868. Uh, so this sign characteristic is it actually has properties that Krein doesn't have. Like for example, zero eigenvalues of a Hermitian matrix pencil have a sign characteristic. Okay, so an implication is that a necessary condition for two characteristics to transition from real to complex is they have opposite sign characteristics. This is very useful if you have a very large dimensional multiphase one and you want to keep track of eigenvalues. So at the end of the day, those that are familiar with Krein's signature and how it can be used to track eigenvalues, it's the same idea here. You can use it to attach to each eigenvalue a sign and know which ones could collide and become complex. Now, <clears throat> A tidier way of dealing with this is to, to eliminate the first row, and then you get uh, a quadratic Hermitian matrix, wait, a Hermitian quadratic matrix polynomial. Uh, and there's an extensive literature on this class of eigenvalue problems. Uh, a key property is the simple root has a sign characteristic. So as you might expect, you have the same sign characteristic, it's just defined differently. And it's been quite a bit of work on this. And Dan and I have done uh, adapting the theory of the sign characteristic to window modulation theory. Okay, so now in moving into the 21st century uh, to study the effect of nonlinearity on coalescing characteristics. So um, 
we take a slightly different strategy. So given a nonlinear PDE generated by Lagrangian with a basic state, periodic basic state, a modulation on Zots is proposed instead. Okay, so to, to recover the original Widom modulation equations, so instead of Widom's approach of um, doing a secondary variation principle, we just start from scratch from the original equation uh, and introduce an onsatz for the uh, perturbation with a remainder, W. So this is closer in spirit to what people do in the geometric optics, okay? Uh, but if you just take this onsatz, and it's important that you have to perturb the frequency of wave number as well, you plug that into your equations and grind away in solvability at second order generates uh, the standard WMEs. I've written these as, co as coefficients, but these this is a nonlinear equation. And I fixed that in the next slide, I thought maybe not. Okay, yeah, the, the slide after that. Uh, okay, so what we've been doing in the past few years is that if Widom theory breaks down, when I say it breaks down, I mean the, it has a zero characteristic or a double characteristic, then we say Widom theory is no longer valid and we remodulate in the neighborhood of that parameter. And so we uh, generate new equations. So example, if we take the dispersionless Widom modulation equations with BK equal to zero, that gives us a zero eigenvalue. Now we remodulate. That means we change that onsatz, and I'll show in the next slide what I mean by that. We change the onsatz, so we change the scaling on T, and we get a new equation when we introduce the solvability condition. And so when you have a zero characteristic, uh, and you have to go back to the original equations, you cannot get this from Widom equations. You remodulate, and you get dispersion, and in fact, you get KDV in that case. Now you can go and try and see what happens when you introduce additional singularities. Suppose that that coefficient is zero. Well, then you get two-way Boussin-esque. Suppose that coefficient is zero, then you remodulate and get MKDV. If that coefficient is zero, you remodulate and you get um, uh, fifth order KDV. And notice in all these cases, the coefficients are determined by derivatives of the average Lagrangian. Now there's related diagrams. This is the one with BK equals zero. We could replace that with the condition for double characteristics and get another uh, strata uh, stratification of new modulation equations. And then if you use Ratliff's moving frame, you lower the co-dimension by one and you can get another chart uh, where you can get some of these with lower co-dimension. Okay, let me show you what I mean by remodulation. The original, this is the original uh, Widow modulation theory on Zots with this geometric optic scaling. And that generates a nonlinear equation. If I took this epsilon out and put it here and here, this equation would be linear, conservation of wave, act, wave action. Now, if we introduce a new scaling of this type, an epsilon cubed remainder, slower time scale, we generate this equation, which looks a little bit like KDV, but it's mixed. Um, I'm doing this for the single phase case. We're not to W67 yet. Okay, so I just argued that if you have coalescing characteristics in classical one phase with a modulation theory, you're going to get under remodulation a new equation. Now, if you take these two equations and combine them, you get the two way Boussinesque equation. Okay, and the coefficients are obtained from the average Lagrangian. This is so, some work that we did uh, with Dan a couple of years ago. Okay, but we need now the multi-phase case. Now, this is gonna get a bit heavy, so I'm gonna do this quickly, because um, <clears throat> the, the idea is roughly the same. You can still get two-way Boussin-esque, but you have to do a little bit more work because the uh, characteristics are uh, the roots of the determinant of this Hermitian uh, eigenvalue problem that's quadratic. <clears throat> and uh, at the coalescence, I'm gonna call this C sub G because it actually is related to a group velocity, but it's defined by that value of C at the double characteristic. 
And then you're going to need this eigenvector zeta, which is the eigenvector associated with that eigenvalue. And an interesting thing here is you get a Jordan chain. I forgot to mention that earlier that another thing about Hermitian matrix pencils with indefinite metric, you can have Jordan chains. Uh, now, for mo now we just remodulate, same as this. I'm just adapting it to the vector valued case uh, with similar space and time scales. Uh, but now it's a little bit tricky. You need a double reduction from, because you can have two n modulation equations. But I'm claiming you get a scalar two way Boosen esque. So there is a two step process where you go from the uh, conservation of wave action on n dimensions, which is this first equation here, which is not closed, but projection onto the kernel of E gives us the two way Boosen esque equation for what? For U, which is the projection onto the eigenspace of E of the wave number. And again, the coefficients can be expressed in terms of the average Lagrangian and now in vector form. Okay, now let's go back to Stokes waves. Let's go back to W67. Uh, now, based on the above theory, we would expect that the modulation equations in W67 to be replaced by a form of two-way Boosen S equation in the unfolding of the double eigenvalue, the double characteristic. Well, it turns out that cap is zero at the transition. So the nonlinearity is cubic, question mark, something like this. It's not asymptotically valid. Okay, so we have to go back and remodulate, find the right scales in order to remodulate to get what is the modulation equation that generalizes this, okay? And in fact, Dan has done this in his PhD thesis, and here is the equation here. So you have the two-way Boos and S in, at the linear part, a cubic nonlinearity, but these terms come in as well. Uh, and again, the coefficients are determined from the average Lagrangian. Okay, now, uh, so this, is the equation in W6 that generalizes W67. Uh, and at KH, at KH naught equal to 1.363 and non-dimensionalization, you can find explicit numbers for the coefficients. Now, then you might ask, what are the solutions of this uh, equation? Or you might ask, what are we gonna do with this equation? Well. Uh, the first thing we did is to ask, are there any interesting solutions that might tell us something about water waves? Well, you start with the steady equation. The steady equation relative to a moving frame is this ODE, which, um, well, if we let U be W of C, where C is a traveling wave, uh, you get this ODE, which uh, will be familiar to many as the Gardner equation which has been completely analyzed and one expects heteroclinic, homoclinic and periodic orbits. Okay, right. Well, nicely, rather nicely, when alpha one, alpha three, alpha one, alpha three product is less than zero, you get a heteroclinic orbit. In the phase plane, think about the phase plane for W and W prime. Heteroclinic orbit connecting two conjugate states. And you can write the explicit solution down with W equal to minus theta Z. It is uh, this equation, equation here. It's a hyperbolic tangent, your typical form for a, a front. But we're in wave number space. So this heteroclinic orbit can be interpreted, interpreted as a jump in wave number space. Now I put wave number in quotes here because Q has components, wave number of the wave and the mean flow velocity. So this is a jump in that space, a projection on that space. So we're not quite sure what the significance of that is. The conjugate states that are connected are two Stokes waves. Okay, so now we have uh, work to do and we're running out of time.
So I will just indicate some work in progress uh, and to try to uh, understand a little bit more about what's going on at this transition. Uh, so we're doing some numerical simulation of the full waterway problem using the AFM scheme. We're doing further analysis and numerics on the modulation equation. I'm sure there's a lot going on in that modulation equation. And uh, looking at connections of the wave number jump to the concept of frequency downshifting that's so familiar in the theory of water waves. But my view is that there are lots the whole concept of wave number jumps and frequency jumps is way understudied in the theory of water waves. I think that there is a lot more uh, of this type of jumping happening. And one nice thing about Witte modulation theory is your equations are in terms of the wave number and frequency. So jumps can be analyzed quite directly. And we're looking at the Benny Roskis equations for corroboration. Now, this is slightly ironic. Um, but Benny Roskis equations, we can apply with a modulation theory, get the same coalescing characteristics in the same modulation equation unfolding. So it makes for nice corroboration. Okay, well, uh, I've run out of time and I've run out of slides, coincidentally. <laughs> and so I will leave this last slide up, which is uh, some references to some of the stuff we've been doing. All right, thank you, Tom. That was great.